Yeah, so that's it. So welcome everyone tonight. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to act as the chair of this uh, uh, South Asia Institute and Center of Law, Environment and Development event. Um, maybe many of you know Dr. Mayur Suresh, who is teaching here at the uh, law department. And uh, uh, his talk is on property, fertility, and witchcraft a preliminary ethnography of witch hunting cases in Jharkhand. So he combines anthropology and law, it seems, and uh, as an anthropologist who worked on the law himself in India, and particularly interested in it. And whatever else you want to know, you can read it on the source uh, web page. I don't want to take any time from the break. Um, so thank you, uh, Philippe, thank you for this uh, South Asia um, study, uh, so South Asia Center here at SOAS for allowing me to do this presentation. Um, I should say there are several caveats. So this is a product of um, fieldwork, very preliminary fieldwork, which is why there's a preliminary in there, um, that I did um, in Jharkhand, um, which is a state in central eastern India, um, over August, September. Um, and I'll get into where I went and how I did the fieldwork and stuff. Um, also, you should probably note there's a slight title change. Uh, I've dropped the idea of fertility. Um, it's one of those things when you write the abstract, you overpromise, And then when you actually write the paper, you think, okay, maybe fertility doesn't work. But we'll see how kind of fertility may come across. Or you'll probably see at the end of the, reason, end of the um, presentation of why I don't think fertility works as a concept. Um, but with that, I'll start. Um, so just to give you kind of a sense of uh, the scale of the problem um, uh, in India and why I think it's a worthy subject, um, it's just from the NCRB, that's the Na National Crime Records Bureau in India, and the statistics end at 2017. Um, on a side note, the present government doesn't like statistics, so which is why we don't have any more. Um, but they end in 2017. And so the figures, I mean, are... Every death is a bad death, but in terms of absolute numbers, you know, it's not, it's not incredibly high. It's 19 in one year. It's down considerably from 54 from, from three years before that. In all in all, over 500 people, 500 women were killed on allegations of being witches um, in the 15-year period between 2001 and 2016. Um, I'll come to what other kinds of violence there are, but just want to give you the official picture of what's happening. And so, um, witchcraft for either, and there are various uh, um, reasons why people are giving me this, is that either because of greater media attention or just the greater number of, um, uh, number of cases of which allegations of witchcraft being reported, violence on the basis of allegations of witchcraft being reported, it's tend to come up a lot more in um, Indian media. Um, so. It, the state of Jharkhand, Bihar, Orissa, Chhattisgarh, Telangana all have high, high incidences officially reported of witchcraft related violence. Um, these are, this is violence against people who are accused of being witches. And of course, as you can see, most of them are women. Um, and also some of these states, Jharkhand, Bihar, Orissa, Chhattisgarh have specific um, anti-witch hunting legislations in place. Uh, the scale of the problem uh, kind of increased for in 2016, or the year ending 2015 and 16, it came up on national media a lot. So in 2016, a law was proposed, uh, a national level law on witch hunting, which kind of lapsed with the, um, the dissolution of parliament. Um, but there was kind of increased debates around witch hunting, like, um, witch hunting um, and anti-witch hunting legislation in India. Um, so I just want to give you kind of a, maybe a, more of a kind of a structure of witchcraft, uh, witch hunting allegations um, uh, in India. So m many of the people who are accused of being witches are mostly women. Um, at times it's just a sort of form of circulation of rumors that there are rumors in, um, uh, there are rumors going around villages and small towns that certain such person is a witch. Um, these rumors escalate and ultimately um, the forms of violence occur and we'll get down to the forms of violence um, in a bit. Um, kind of the other way is, 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 is more structured in a certain sense. There are different players involved. 
Uh, and this is the other way. So some people told me, how, when the, in response to the question of how do you know someone is a witch, the one standard answer is because everyone knows that person is a witch. That indicates that certain forms of rumors are circulating, that forms of news are circulating in local communities, right? And um, there's lots of anthropological literature on how rumor can become fact, and you know, a rumor blurs the distinction between fact and fiction. Um, the other answer that I got in response is how do you know someone is a witch is kind of this structure over here. Um, so usually it starts with, uh, and there are kind of three moving parts to this, it usually starts with the victim of witchcraft. Um, um, this person is um, either sick, um, has several accidents, um, crops fail, um, animals, livestock become sick, and so this person goes to a person called the Ojha. Um, in, translated to me is known as a witch, uh, this person is often tra translated as a witch doctor. Um, this person is often a man. And in the village, the position of the Ojha is often inherited. So the father of an Ojha, the son will be an Ojha as well. Um, and there are different things that this Ojha does. The Ojha is not just about identifying witches, but it kind of operates as a, like a local mendicant. Um, so provides um, kind of herbal remedies, uh, does forms of ritual practice, conducts marriages, um, and also does stuff on uh, uh, does rituals to identify who the witches are. Um, and often, so basically a man who, a person who's sick or ill or has some issues with the land goes to the Oja. The o one of the responses of the Oja is, you have been affected by witchcraft, right? Then the Oja does some religious, or uh, um, conducts some sort of, sort of ceremony where um, the, and I'll get into that later on, and has to do with a lot of the land, and identifies this person who is the, purported witch. So kind of just some sociological things maybe to note is often the victims um, and the alleged purported witch are from the same kinship groups. Um, Mothers-in-law, daughters-in-law uh, can be cousins. Um, they are very often <coughs> within the same village which often means that they are often similar or the same caste group. Um, very rarely in kind of the sociological studies on witchcraft you have witchcraft transcending caste or community or kinship groups. Um, and the, the important thing is the identification of the person as a witch leads to kind of escalating patterns of violence. Um, there was a UN rapporteur um, on extrajudicial killings um, who had a section on um, witchcraft and, uh, and his, uh, his kind of finding was that often the identification of someone as a witch has kind of violent effects. So it's not just the violence that's obviously violent, but the identification itself is a form of witch. Is a form of, um, the identification of, of, of someone as a witch leads to certain forms of violence. Um, and this is kind of some of the headlines that are pulled out. Um, there are accompanying pictures that haven't put those obviously. Um, and so you have a range of things, right? So obviously in the first thing you have um, within um, within a fa family group, an Orissa, um, there's there's obviously death, um, there's forms of assault, forms of violence, um, and also just forms of humiliation, right? Um, I'm not sure if you can see this one over here, but basically the, the, the woman was, was paraded as a witch, her face was blackened, she was garlanded with shoes, and paraded through the village. Um, often identif some identification of someone as, uh, as, the identification of someone as a witch leads, leads to a social, social boycott, that is, people do not talk or interact or e have any economic relations with that person identified as a witch. Uh, forms of public, public humiliation, like over here. Um, other instances are being paraded naked. Um, the, wo the woman is stripped and made to walk through, um, uh, walk through the village. Um, obviously, forms of assault, um, grievous bodily harm. Um, often, uh, people abandon their village, abandon their homes, sometimes temporarily. Uh, sometimes permanently, um, and obviously forms of torture and eventually murder or lynching in certain cases. Um, so the state of Jharkhand and other um, uh, some other states in India have enacted witchcraft legislation. Most of, most of these came in. I'm not sure what the impetus was in, two, in around 2000, but most of them have between 99 and 2001. This is when most of the, most of the legislations came in um, in various states. Um, so 
it operates almost if, akin to um, a sh the um, Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribes, uh, Protection of Civil Rights Act, right? So if you, any of you know it, the naming of someone is itself a crime. Um, so in the SCST Pre uh, Protection of Civil Rights Act, if you call someone uh, um, uh, a, a low caste slur or you use a kind of forms of abuse of language, that itself is, is criminalized. So oh, similarly, if I operate in a similar logic, the naming of someone as a witch becomes a crime. Um, so calling someone a witch uh, using um, any forms of epithets for that person as a witch is also a crime. Um, it also, interestingly enough, criminalizes the use of magic, right, or rituals to cure a witch. Um, and this, this in a sense, this, those provisions uh, target the person called the witch, the person who does the witch curing ceremonies. Um, importantly, it's kind of linked to. Um, it's linked to the idea of mental or physical torture of the, of the person who is purported to be a witch. Um, so those are the kind of two provisions that these that this and other um, anti-witch prevent uh, witch hunting legislation um, uh, criminalizes. Um, and this is just my kind of like rough translation of it of the thing. But the the offense is is purely on identification. Right. So the, the title is about identification, it's the calling, it's the naming of someone as a witch um, that is criminalized. And in a sense, this kind of follows um, or presages later on human rights ideas in 2016, where basically some of the human rights committees basically said that if you, you must criminalize or you must stop the naming of a person as a witch to stop the violence that subsequently arises from that ident identification. Um, so the evidence that we have, we kind of saw the statistics at the beginning of this presentation. Those are the cases in which these witchcraft legislations was actually invoked. So the police will, in cases where there is a murder of a woman or women, will, on the allegation of witchcraft, will not only register a case under murder or assault, will, but will also register a case under um, this particular enactment. So this particular enactment is actually only used as far as we know, when there is assault or murder of a person, right? Whereas the, the act should be used preceding that, um, in a sense, should be used before uh, the, the actual murder of a person. It's meant to protect against that. It's never used in that way. What we do know of just anecdotally on from local level surveys is that witchcraft allegations are extremely common. Um, there was one survey conducted in 2018 which was in one uh, one village um, just outside Ranchi, which estimated that at least one in ten pe one in ten women had had an allegation of witchcraft made against them. So clearly, the the use of the law and the actual incidences of witchcraft allegations um, don't actually match up. So that was kind of the background of uh, of what I wanted, of what the study was trying to do. Um, it was intended to be, <coughs> excuse me, an ethnography of witch hunting trials. So um, trying to understand how knowledge practices, which are, witchcraft knowledge practices are conceptualized by the law, um, how do they understand each other, um, and how are these claims adjudicated in court? How does how does the law understand forms of witchcraft, forms of witch hunting, and also the magic, uh, quote unquote, used by the Ojhas? Um, and that was the plan. So I spent uh, six weeks in Jharkhand, um, in towns and villages. Where, and these are the main towns I went to: Ranchi, Jamshedpur, Chakradharpur. I also did kind of visits to uh, villages close by. Um, I spent time with lawyers, NGOs, community-based organizations. And actually, the community-based organizations were kind of the, the mainstay of this, of this presentation. Um, these were public health organizations um, and livelihood organizations um, and some public education organizations, simply because these were the organizations that, or community organ groups that dealt with women. Uh, these are the groups that kind of organized women, trained women, um, interacted with, with, um, with women on their daily lives. And so this is, these are the kind of groups that are responding to these forms of violence um, and responding to um, uh, witch, witch hunting allegations by producing research about them, even though their main focus isn't on uh, witch hunting allegations. So 
when I asked um, why witch hunting allegations occur, um, these were kind of the common responses. Um, or why does why does witch hunting occur? I mean, it's it's a circular answer. But the circular answer, first one is anvishwas or blind belief. Why do they occur? Because blind belief blind belief leads to witch hunting allegations. It's just the way it is, basically. Is that what, that was one uh, argument. Um, uh, the NGOs and kind of the community organizations gave other uh, other answers as well. One is obviously the lack of education uh, that you don't you can't uh, explain something and therefore you attribute it to some uh, uh, supernatural or um, mystical reason. Um, public health service and many pointed out that often witch witchcraft allegations occur when people fall ill. Um, that there is no idea of of disease, there is no idea of something just happening to you or fate. It has to be caused by something else, right? And your illness has to be caused by a witch. So there's no idea of you just fall sick, rather you just get cursed by a witch, which is why um, the witch hunting, uh, why the why um, you fall ill. Um, the other common uh, um, answer is property disputes, and this is kind of the focus of the rest of the presentation. Um, so. There's an assumption if you do, if you go to Indian Kanun, which is kind of the Indian legal database, and do witch hunting allegations, you will find many of these cases will narrate property disputes into the judgment. Um, and this is the kind of the assumption that I want to unpack. Excuse me, in this presentation. Um, so let's take one of the cases that I came across in my um, in my field work. And this is, I've changed the names over here and the places, oh, change the names. Um, so this is the case of Jagat Munda. Um, he, and this, uh, this is an excerpt from uh, the first information report that he submitted to the police. Um, uh, at about 9.30 at night, the village headman and three other people, uh, he names them over there, forced the way into my house. They told my wife and I that you have both put black magic on my son Soma because of which he has fallen from a tamarind tree and has sustained bad injuries. I told them that your son has fallen a month ago. Then they became violent and started break things, breaking things around my house, like the roof and pots and the fireplace. They also told us that we had put black magic on another person, Fagua Munda, two years ago, because of which he had an <coughs> illness and died. They told us today that we have been saved, but we would not be saved in the future. They began to kick us so badly that we ran into the forest to sleep. We stayed in the jungle all night, and then for 12, 13 days, Thereafter, they came out of the jungle and then they filed a police complaint. So, very kind of typical story that there, something has happened in the village. Um, yeah, the village headman's son falls of a tamarind tree. There's no conception of fate or accident. This has to be a product of witchcraft, right? Um, the other thing you'll notice over here is there's no Ojha involved. Um, I'm not sure why, but there is none, so it might be just an allegation. Um, but there's no idea of fate, there's no idea of accident, so this, the, the falling of the village headman's son from the tree must have been a product of witchcraft. Um, forms of threat follow from that form identification, again, like we, we said earlier, they left the house temporarily um, because they feared for their lives. They spent two weeks in the jungle and then finally came out to file, file the police complaint. Um, I spoke to the lawyer, I, didn't, I never met this person called Jagat Munda. Um, according to the lawyer, he, they didn't know why they were being um, witches, but the lawyer kind of told me in conspirational tones, conspiratorial tones, that I know the reason why. It's because of a property dispute, of land dispute. And his argument was that as this, um, this uh, um, property, where this, the village where this um, dispute took place, or this allegation took place, was close to Ranchi, there was an increased, um, Ranchi's the, um, the biggest town in uh, sorry Jamshe in Jharkhand, um, and it's growing rapidly as you can imagine. Um, as it was growing rapidly, there was a land mafia behind it, right? And these are kind of some excerpts from um, the interview. So he says basically, first thing he says that this is not in the FIR, but I know the truth for sure. Um, imagine you are a widow and uh, and you have land, but you're not willing to sell it. Whatever the people want to do, they'll tr they'll try and get it through the system, but you will fight it. Then what they do is to hatch a conspiracy. That we will do this. It is that we will brand this person a witch because we know that witches exist in our culture. Mm -hmm. Then everyone agrees, meaning that they spread this news. 
Um, then you take any, any incident like ha that happens, like this one. You say the child fell from the tamarind tree, and then you blame the widow. Then you spread the story here and there. You tell one person and another. Then you get the panchayat together, and then you have a conspiracy. Um, everyone will believe it, uh, and this person is obviously not a tribal. Um, everyone will believe it because the accusation, these tribals, amongst whom the allegations are said to be um, pre prevalent, are very naive. You tell them one thing and they believe it, right? Um, all the tribals chase the, the witch out of the village, all the tribals go to jail, then you can come in and take the property, right? So it's this kind of, behind this idea of the property dispute is this idea of the conspiracy, right? There is something <coughs> real behind this property dispute that behind the, um, this allegation of, uh, of witchcraft lies this idea of, of a land grab, right? That there's some sinister controlling authority behind or mind behind this allegation which can come in and take the property away. Um, and you kind of see this, um, this logic at play, this kind of this logic of the grand conspiracy at play uh, in different um, reports and kind of social legal uh, texts as well. Um, and this comes not only just from, I have to emphasize, this comes not only from um, policy and law, but also from certain victims, or at least speaking through the policy documents themselves. <laughs> um, so in a study by Ali, that's um, uh, Association, I forget what the full second A is, but for legal initiatives, um, which is basically um, a legal NGO in, in Ranchi and in uh, Lucknow. Um, they did a report in 2017 on kind of why witchcraft happened. And one of the reasons they came to conclusion was the property disputes. So again over here they quote a man who's, who's, who, her, whose uh, wife had been shot dead. And basically the man, in their words, said that this was a property dispute. Um, that someone wanted the title to the house, he didn't agree, and therefore they shot his, his um, wife on the allegation that um, uh, this person was a witch. Um, again, another... Uh, Public policy, this is a public body called the Jharkhand State um, Livelihood Promotion Society. It's kind of a quasi-governmental organization that promotes, promotes um, <coughs> economic credit um, amongst women. And like I said, these are one of some of the organizations that are having to ha respond to allegations of witchcraft. Um, basically, again, say that um, the real motive is acquisition of land or property. Um, like I said earlier, court cases often narrate this as, as a thing as well, uh, that property is the underlying cause um, for uh, uh, for these witchcraft allegations, um, interesting. There was a study done by the Partners for Law and Development, which is a legal NGO, NGO in um, Delhi, um, and they analyzed um, 88 FIRs um, from three states: Jharkhand, Bihar, and Chhattisgarh. Um, and they what they did was basically they took, looked at the FIR, that's the com initial complaints made to the police officers. And then they went and interviewed um, the survivors of the victims of uh, witch hunting violence. Um, and they often found that even though it was narrated in the FIRs as, um, as uh, the motive for this witch hunting allegation, often there was no, the, the victims themselves never narrated as a form of, pro of, of as a property dispute. Right? So what might be happening over here, and this is not something they suggest, but I suggest, that the only way the, 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 the state or the police can rationalize um, this, uh, uh, or can rationalize this offense to the court is by naming it as a property dispute. There's no, there's very little conception of belief or um, magic that, is, is that the police are able to rationalize or put, put in some kind of rational text that the courts or they themselves can, can legitimately write down in their, um, uh, in their kind of documents. Um, so, as I suggested earlier, I think some, the, the discourse of property disputes as behind um, witch hunting allegations is one of a conspiracy, right? Behind, um, behind the witch hunting, uh, witchcraft allegation is the idea that there is a grand conspiracy and then that these witch hunting allegations are orchestrated by people in power just to get um, and to dupe the naive tribals into getting um, uh, that property. Um, so, during my time in Jharkhand, I kind of spent time with ASHA volunteers. When I read ASHA volunteers, those, those are accredited, accredited social health um, activists. Um, again, they're accredited by the state to do um, public health initiatives. 
And many of them were my primary sources of um, primary interlocutors over here. And so m many of them disputed this account, right? They disputed the account of the idea that there's a property dispute at the heart of it. Um, simple logical reasons. One is that if you wanted to take my land, there are, there's no, that you could just chase me off of the land, right? Um, there is no, there are no, there's very few systems of land records. Um, and often it, land works by possession, so you just take possession of the land. Um, and also they point to the other, other end. So sometimes uh, someone who's accused of being a witch, when they're either killed or chased off the land, the land is left, left empty. As if it was, too, it's, you can't go close to it. Um, there's something dangerous about the land over there. Right? So the idea of, of property dispute being at the heart of um, uh, a land is, uh, of a witchcraft allegation doesn't quite exp go enough, go far enough to explain why witchcraft, witch hunting allegations happen. And the other thing is, it doesn't explain the horrific nature of violation of the violence, right? If it was just a land dispute, you would chase them off, beat them away, and they, once they left, it would be okay. But there was one case in 2016 where the five women in a village were, were stripped naked, taken to the local um, they call it akara, it's a local ritual place. Um, according to police records, at least 35 people of the village, a village of 150, went there and basically killed them, lynched them to death, right? So the property dispute doesn't, the idea of a property dispute doesn't quite take into account the scale and the kind of viciousness of the violence that, that kind of happens in these, um, in these cases. Um, so I, I'm kind of interested in this idea of land. I, I do think there's a connection that the land has to witch, witch hunting allegations, but I don't think it's the idea of property. Um, so what I'm trying in this presentation is an idea. Um, so moving away from land as property. So when you, when you say land as property, it involves some sort of, um, you imagine land as being productive, as you take land as a form of wealth, right? You capture land in order to become richer, to make your life easier, to produce more, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea of land is productivity, right? I think the, the link between land and witchcraft is one, that something goes in a slightly different direction. Um, one is that land becomes, as, and I'll show this later on, I've realized I've taken a lot of time, um, as later on in the presentation, is that land becomes kind of indexes potential threats. It tells the, tells the people in, in, on that land where the threat lies. And it's just not a physical threat, as I've shown in a second. Um, and land also becomes kind of a legible text. So you have to read the land in order to figure out where the threat lies, or what kind of threats exist. Um, land also provides a way in which to deal with those threats. And I realize it's kind of um, ambiguous now, or vague now, but hopefully it'll become clearer in a second. So this is the kind of idea that I want to move away from. So thinking about instead of land as property is productive, but to land as kind of uh, kind of a legible text would tell you what tells you what kind of threat exists in your social world. Um, so the first thing I note, I guess, is that witchcraft is only one part of this kind of ecosystem of belief. Right? This is only one of the things that that forms a part of the kind of the supernatural world, if you, call, you want to call it that of um, kind of the milieu in which this happens, right? Um, so the land is also inhabited by ghosts and spirits. Um, there are other supernatural beings at play. Um, so one of the Asha workers kind of on the board over there, he narrates how he felt sick uh, when he was younger. He went to the Ojha with his mother, the mother said, and then the, then, um, the Ojha asked him, did you go to that place? Uh, which has a row of coconut trees and a thatched hut with um, basically identifies a particular part of the land. Um, the Oja says that place has um, um, a spirit, a preeth in it, um, and that's fallen onto you, that's why you're falling ill. Right? The Oja did jhat pook is, I'm not sure what exactly it means, but it's a, it's a form of, I, he, I, I imagine there's some form of broom, um, well there is a broom I know, um, but there's some kind of ceremony that he does to get rid of the spirit. Right. Um, another Asha worker told me about how uh, ghosts can enter you. Right. So over here again, the problem is the ghost can enter you through the navel. How do you prevent that? You take the dung of your goat, you mix it with your land or soft oil, and you put it in. You put it in the baby's um, uh, umbilical cord to prevent the ghost from entering. So that's another type of kind of supernatural being that exists in on the land. Um, 
I particularly like this one. I was told several um, several narratives about uh, I have two names for him as well, Chunru or Chamak. Um, one they described him very short, has a ponytail, um, takes your um, um, he can be a nice person. So basically, if suddenly you have twenty people coming for coming home, you he, ch this person ch Chunru or Chamak will help you cook rice for those uh, uh, for the number of people. He's also vindictive. If you don't set aside rice for him, he will basically take a grain from your stores and give it to someone else, right? So witchcraft exists in this milieu, and I'm sure there are more which haven't been told of, um, which haven't been haven't come across. But the witchcraft exists in um, this milieu where there is a constant threat, right? There are other forms of threat being on the um, uh, on the land itself, and you can I, again see the link between. Um, the idea of witchcraft and land through the figure of the Ojha. I mean, the Ojha, quick recap, is the person who is the witch doctor. Um, and so the Ojha, like I said earlier, is, is a position that's quasi inherited. Um, there's nothing in, in any law or rule that says the Ojha's son becomes an Ojha. It's just that the Ojha's son is trained to become, trained to become an Ojha. Um, and to kind of what what I've been told was that the Ojha learns what plants do what, um, how to make certain med medications from these plants, um, and how to perform certain rituals. The Ojha is also to told um, to look for threats in the land, right? Um, so looking for certain signs in the land, uh, this could be certain types of trees, arrangement of rocks, um, direction of the house, um, conditions of certain type of plants. So one of the witch hunting allegations that I heard was that um, the Ojha told this person, you have been affected by witchcraft. If you have, um, if you dig up a certain type of plant, I forget which type of plant it is, and you find a bunch of certain types of rocks. So rocks are arranged in this pattern. And this is what the Ojha said. So the Ojha enables you to read the land or um, in order to search for kind of um, threats. Um, the Ojha also makes the land legible, right? And what do I mean by that? So there are certain things which the Ojha will say, look at that tree, this, this tree, position of this tree means that you have been affected by either a bhut or a preet, different types of spirits, or the witch, or a witch, right? But sometimes the land is not immediately legible, so it needs to be made legible. Um, so this is, this is done by performing certain rituals on the land. Um, this is one of the rituals that I heard of, um, and this was narrated by an Asha worker, the first one. Um, her marriage was not going well, uh, so he, that is the Ojha, drew a design on the ground. He put, he threw some mirrors on it um, and some seeds. Um, waited the next day. Obviously, the seeds weren't there, um, and so the problem was that the marriage was not correct, was not performed in the correct place. Um, and this is later on in the same interview. And so basically, they re-performed the, the, um, the marriage. Um, the bride side uh, walked from their village, and the groom side walked from their village with different Ochas. Wherever they met, apparently it was predicted that they would meet under a certain tree. And that part, that tree would be the, the correct place where to do uh, um, the marriage ceremony. So the land itself has to be made leg legible. Right? So either it can be read on its face, or you do certain things in order to know where the threat lies and how to ameliorate that threat. Um, so, and the threat includes um, the idea of witchcraft, right? So you, you can read the land in certain ways in order to look for ideas of witchcraft. Um, so, this is one of, uh, sorry, this is one of the, um, the narratives given to me uh, as an example. Um, imagine a person falls ill, has an accident, they go to the Ojha to determine what the cause was. The Ojha performs a ritual on the land itself, right? Um, at times it can be a specific part of the land, the person's home. Um, the two rituals were, that were described to me, one was of course, as we saw earlier, the drawing of a design on the ground and the throwing of objects on it in order to render the land legible. And the other one was the boiling of lentils, so certain types of lentils um, were, were boiled and then read. I'm not sure how it, uh, that happened, that wasn't demonstrated, but um, th that was one of the ways in which you could read a threat from the land. Um, 
And like earlier itself, you could also tell uh, which which craft allegations from uh, kind of just certain types of plants, arrangement of stones, direction of the home. Um, so upon reading the signs, the Ojha may de declare that you have been afflicted by witchcraft. One of the options is you've been afflicted by witchcraft. The other options are, of course, you've been affected by a bhut or a preet or something else. Um, but one of the options is that you've been affected by witchcraft. And I found this kind of phrase um, interesting because the, it was never, very rarely was it that someone has put black magic on you or something else. It's, um, is the that the like that the witch is eating you from the inside, right? And I found this kind of particularly evocative because it suggests the opposite of fertility, but that's why I dropped fertility. Anyways, um, but it's uh, it's just this. I found this idea that the something is eating you from the inside, it's taking your life away from the inside, uh, evocative of something. I'm not sure exactly what yet. Um, so the ojha can suggest that you do some rituals to counteract it, right? Um, so this usually involves um, uh, animal sacrifice, again um, involving you sacrifice either a goat or has to be a black goat um, or a chicken. There is something that I've never seen this, so I'm not sure, I'm, just, I'm relying on second hand descriptions of using the blood on the ground again. And again, you use of similar designs to counteract that. Um, if that doesn't work, you can do certain rituals to kind of virally affect the, the witch itself, witch herself. Uh, and I, I particularly like this one. We are not that kind of people because if this was a narrative set to me. So basically, um, the, obviously the first thing didn't finish. The first thing didn't help um, ameliorate the illness or what was, uh, the illness that was affecting the afflicted person. So the Oja says, you know, we can perform another ritual where you can, ha where you can um, have violence on the witch, right? And um, the person involved said, but we are not that kind of people who um, do violence on other people. Um, so this idea that you can, that that usage of witchcraft has to be only for defensive, not offensive purposes, I think was quite interesting. Um, so if that finally doesn't work, if that finally doesn't work, what you can do then is, what the Ojah then does, is perform rituals which can identify who the witch is, right? So you have the first step where you kind of try and counteract what the witch does, the second step is kind of affecting the witch herself. And the third step is more ways in which you can identify who the, who the person who is allegedly the witch is. Um, again, this is not done directly. So the Ojha will never say that person X or person Y is the witch. Instead, again over here, which I found interesting was that the Ojha has to read certain signs which will give you the identity of the witch. So it's never this person over here. It's instead, is there a person near your house who has, um, who has a house facing in a particular direction? Does a person near your house have this particular type of tree? Um, is, the, is that person's house along a long path and standing alone? Right. So these are, um, the, the witch's identity itself ha is, enabled, is, is, is revealed through the reading of the text, through the reading of the land as a text. Um, and I'll quickly finish over here, is just to think, rethink, and maybe it's a, rather than a conclusion, but a summary, um, is just rethink the idea between the link between land, property, and witchcraft, right? To think of land not in terms of a land dispute, but about how land can um, index certain threats, um, and how in the, in the kind of the attention to the way in which witchcraft allegations occur, um, reveal that land becomes um, indexes certain forms of threats, can be something that's read and can eventually reveal who uh, or what kind of threat it is and if it is a witchcraft threat, what, how the witch can be identified. Um, and I'll end there. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, to start the discussion of I would like you to ask you a very simple question. Uh, what group are you actually talking about? As anthropologists, I, I usually uh, have to first describe you know, the exact context and which belief in which place, etc. You mentioned tribals. Yeah. I mean, the, the, all these customs change from place to place. How does that, I mean, if, are you talking about one particular group? 
how does that then relate to the statistics which you initially yeah. presented? And number three, uh, the, how does it explain the intensity of the violence which you find uh, puzzling, rightly so? What was number two, sorry? Uh, which which uh, group? Tribal? Uh, how does it relate to the statistics, um, which is you know, rather broad, it's not related to a specific group? So, thanks. So that's a good question, thank you. Um, so the, I didn't do any, it was, it's very preliminary, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't, it was more kind of aerial survey rather than in depth within in communities. Um, the, the predominant group, um, the ASHA workers were from the whole tribal community, um, uh, but mostly from the whole tribal community. Uh, a number of them were from broadly identified uh, scheduled caste communities um, or OBC communities. Um, it, and so that's an open question. I don't know uh, sometimes who the, which communities are. Um, and can, I, can I just ask yeah. to that point? Do you have the information from lawyers mm -hmm. or from uh, informants from the village? Because my experience is that lawyers mm -hmm. usually haven't got a clue, but they they yeah. they work within the context of the law. Yeah, you know? yeah. So it's 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 mostly from the the, the communities themselves. So it's the okay. the um, often the legal documents are basically say Munda or uh, monkey, uh, which I then doesn't I then it doesn't it's um it's not it's a more of a status within the village rather than a community. Um, the um, the the people who I met mostly from the whole community, I would say. Um, one just identified herself as OBC, um, and I was told of other people who were who identified as certain caste. Um, in terms of who is generally affected, um, the statistics there are the I have to say first there aren't that many statistics on uh, on which which hunting allegations uh, or which craft allegations. Um, it's mostly um, ethnographic work. Um, so in terms of statistics, I'm not sure to be honest. Um, the PLD report um, that uh, that uh, um, I cited earlier, basically of the 88 FIRs that they, a very tiny sample, um, again relying on the state records. But when they went back, they found that most of the people who were broadly identified as scheduled tribes. Um, uh, and there is a disaggregation of that in the report I can't remember now. But that was again across three states, remember. So it was again uh, across Jharkhand, Bihar, and Chhattisgarh. Um, so it doesn't give, give us a sense of, in terms of statistically where it happens most often. Um, even amongst the ASHA workers who are part of the of the whole community, basically said it happened amongst in, in their own those tribal communities. Um, why it happened amongst tribal communities? Um, they said it's because of just belief. Um, but they also in, in, in interestingly said that they it was spreading to other communities as well, um, as if which of the power that could like be is transferable between communities. Um, but in terms of statistics, the, it's an open question. I'm not sure. Um, and I, as far as I know, no one is sure. Um, um, in terms of the intensity of the violence, um, I think it's just I, the. Um, the idea that this the the, um, the presence of the witch pose an existential threat to the community, I think, is that what's at stake. So often, what you hear is that you know this um, this person first, and it's so it isn't just usually just one allegation of, of witchcraft. These kind of build up. Um, so the Oja is involved. Um, one person goes, the other person says um, that the Oja says this person's a witch. I mean, it doesn't say this person's a witch, but they can, the community surmise, surmises that this person X is a witch. Um, and it builds up over time. In 2016, um, uh, event that I narrated, basically, they, at least in the, in the uh, police records, is that, that uh, the violence or the allegations went back at least 10 years. Um, so the, in, um, this is the one where the, the five women were, were killed, were lynched in the village. So the daughters basically escaped. Um, they, they're the ones who made prosecution witnesses. And at least in the court records, they, it was about going back 10 years that, were first, that their mothers were first accused of being witches. Um, and um, it doesn't say what the allegations were or why the allegations were made. 
um, but it just says why the, uh, that the allegations were there. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that maybe kind of explains at least the part of the intensity of the violence. Um, Any further questions? Yes. You mentioned very briefly the Panchayat. Um, does that sort of, do they often get involved on the side of the accusers rather than the victim? Um, and sort of, if they do get involved on the side of the accuser, how does that influence sort of the success of prosecutions or official interventions? Yeah, so. Sorry. No way. So, the, um, in, um, in the lower part, there's West Singbo. Mm -hmm. uh, the he for some historical reason, and everyone said, I, I asked why to a local activist, and they forwarded me um, a scan of a document. Anyways, long story, but if for, some, for some historical reason, that the a police complaint will only be registered on the complaint of the village headman. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, if the, if this, if, like in the case of Jagamunda, where the village headman himself is making um, uh, the allegation, a police complaint becomes near impossible. Um, so, um, the people, some people who are so in uh, West Singhum again, also in a place called Chakradharpur, Chai Basa, um, they, the women try to go and um, uh, file a police complaint. So, the, what happened was, if I remember correctly, uh, there was an allegation of witchcraft. Um, some some men came and tried to threaten this woman. The woman involved went to um, a social health worker. Um, they both went to the police station. They went to the police station, and the police station says, "You haven't got where's the munda? Where's the headman?" Um, and so they had to go back and get the munda to come. The munda refused to come, um, and then finally they went to the local district headquarters, which is uh, Chai Basa, and got a lawyer to file a complaint for them. Um, but I think that's the problem, right? So the usually the con and you, when the police do come in, it's more of a uh, so sorry to go back on the same story. They went they went to the police. The police first time said, you know, they just call you names, just forget about it. That's not an issue. So they threatened you. What's the problem, right? Um, and they kind of they kind of did um, some ch some sort of like kind of um, mediation. For the city. It wasn't treated as a criminal offense. Treated as a minor altercation where you know if we just get parties together, they'll be fine. Uh, just a dispute. Um, so um, often the panchayat will often leave the social ostracization um, thing, where they say that you, the certain person, has to leave the village because that person um, is a witch, um, or the family has to leave the village because that person is a witch. Um, so yeah, it's it's the, the official state structure kind of feed off um, panchayat and kind of the village headman system. Was there another question? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's good. Um, if you don't mind, that kind of follow up. Like, are there any women sort of on the panchayat? And so sort of, does that affect how that works in that area? So sort of, if women get authority in specific society or women? I don't know, um, is a question. Um, that's a good question to ask. But as far as, as, far as I know, the, the panchayat large institutions in the areas which were, were, weren't, weren't visible. Yeah. Um, the official ones at least. Um, what people tended to refer to in the narratives was the headman or, and they have another um, uh, another unofficial official position called, traditionally official position, uh, called the monkey, which is basically a person who's above the village headman. It's kind of the, the um, uh, kind of the local district headman, so to speak. And there's a, there's a council of headmen. Um, so in the narratives to me, the panchayat was not something that often came up. Um, in terms, there might be some things of uh, ostracization, but it's also often used as almost synonymous with the council of headmen. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, thanks, Mario. Um, perhaps my question maybe is a follow-up to this, but from a different context. Um, is there enough information to identify the maybe the gender situation of um, the people who are essentially um, accused of witchcraft, whether it's maybe predominantly women yeah. or men or a mix of both, and also the the age, the information about the age of the group of the people accused yeah. of witchcraft are they? Younger people, middle-aged, older women, older men—is it all across that range? Yeah. 
So again, the uh, PLD report that I cited, there's only people who've done like statistical work on it. I mean, the samples are very limited. I think something like 98% of all accusations were made against women. Um, Jagat Munda is a man, um, but even his lawyer says that he was an outlier, um, that often it's mostly against women. Um, in terms of age, it's huge, it's anyone above the age of puberty, basically. Um, the logic is that, um, that so what I was told was that a, a woman only becomes a witch after puberty, um, that she's only educated in witchcraft after puberty. And often, um, at the time of becoming a witch, the person is improperly uh, um, become, trained in becoming a witch at the, around puberty, is then the person goes crazy. Um, so often, there, there was one narrative in um, this village outside Chakradarpur where they told me about how this person went simply crazy because her, at the age of 13 or 14, her witchcraft training hadn't happened properly. I mean, so I think it's, uh, it's um, yeah, above a certain age. Um, again, the statistics are anyone, I mean, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but basically anyone above the age of uh, puberty and onwards. Um, most of the women were up to like 60 or 70. Um, but again, one of the, some of the narratives talk about people like women who are 81. Um, interestingly enough, like again, they didn't find um, any economic uh, uh, indicators of who becomes a witch, or educational indicators of who gets accused of being a witch. Um, so, according to their study, at least, and according to my informants, at least, there's no there's no reason for someone to become a witch. So, thinking of thinking of witchcraft in terms of um, statistical pointers doesn't actually help because it's at least in the minds of my informants and in the limited statistics we have, there's no there's no objective indicator of who might be accused of witchcraft. I found it when I when I read, googled this, I was interested in the, the law itself. It was called maybe wrongly the Hindu Witchcraft Prevention Act. Yeah. Is that the real name of it? No, it's Dayan uh Dayan uh, Prati um Dayan Pratap Pratishe Adinya. So the Prevention of Witch Identification Act. Um, so it's it goes by various translations. Um, the prevention of uh, it was—it's an interesting act because it not only prevents identification of the act of a person as a witch, but also prevents um, against the use of witchcraft practices. That's the practices of the Ojha to identify the witch. Um, as far as I know, no one's ever been convicted under that, and I don't know how the court conceptualizes what the practice of an Ojha is. Um, but usually, the Ojha is kind of criminalized along with. Um, uh, conspiracy to commit these crimes. So it's not as a separate act um, as the use of which to identify which. So the, apparently in, in the UK law this uh, exists a uh, precedent. I was surprised you said this is the first time that such an act has been, such acts have been devised in India, is that true? No. Um, so there's a general provision under the Indian Penal Code, uh -huh. which basically says if you cause someone to be put under um, fear of harm or um, supernatural wrath or something like that, I forget the exact terminology of it, you can be, you can be accused, you, you've committed an offense. Um, and um, so that, that, that provision's been used in certain cases to um, convict, uh, well, I don't know, I wouldn't say convict, but along with this prevention of which identification act, often the police put that charge as well um, to uh, say that you have put someone else under the impression that they are under some sort of super threat to natural power. Um, so I didn't know about the witchcraft prevention in the UK law, um, but uh, something I'll definitely look at. Uh, yeah, I just wanted, you might have referred to this at the start, uh, did you, the land grab aspect that you mentioned and you said the healthcare workers story versus the lawyers, is your reading then that, that it's not about the land, uh, it's not about the land grabs or it's too simple to say it's the land grabs? Um, and then the other question is maybe 
a broader question because this is preliminary what your next steps are with this research. Yeah. Where you're going, where you're um, yeah, so I th yeah, so that's basically the argument, I think, in relation to the land, right? It's too simple to say that it's a property dispute. Um, simply because it doesn't, if it was a property dispute, there are other ways in which you can, um, as I say, kabzakar over the land, take over the land uh, in terms of possession or ownership or whatever. It doesn't need to be by its mechanism. Um, it also doesn't account for the fact that sometimes um, that, uh, as I said earlier, that the land of the purported witch is often left empty um, after. after the witch uh, hunting allegation is made or witchcraft allegation is made. Um, so it doesn't take into that. I, I again, I haven't statistically verified this. But this is what I've been told. So in in case in some cases where this, this um, one of the Asha workers <coughs> told me was that where the witchcraft allegation is made, the person is left and no one has taken over the land. So where was the witch hunting, where was the witchcraft allegation, um, or why was it made? So the land grab, I, I think there is a connection to land, but I don't think it's with regard to a property dispute. I think the property dispute narrative is built in by the police and the courts to kind of rationalize an irrational, what they say is an irrational um, practice. Um, but I don't think it, it's, it's a good objective justification for it, if that makes sense. In terms of next steps, um, well, I'm, my plan, hopefully, is to, it's, I mean, the, the plan has changed. I wanted to do kind of courtroom ethnographies of how, um, how these witch hunting cases are brought to courts, and I still time, would like to try to do that. Um, so the plan is to go to this place called um, uh, Chai Basa and Chakradarpur. Uh, Chai Basa is the district headquarters. They have about 50 cases under the Witch Hunting Prevention Act, which Identification Prevention Act going on, so observe those. But along with that, kind of look at, kind of in a parallel field, so to speak, look at the, um, the social health workers close by because they do a lot of activism and kind of um, awareness building and pure well, pure um, strategies to, to counteract witch hunting um, violence. So kind of those two angles of which I'm going at. So maybe kind of a legal consciousness type project um, slash kotham ethnography. Um, but it's still in the early stages at the moment, so I'm trying to try and figure out what to do with it. Because my initial plan of going to courtrooms and looking at these cases didn't actually pan out because um, it, A, they're spread out geographically, um, the courtrooms that is, um, the cases aren't heard as regularly as it might be in a big other city. Um, so within the kind of span of time, the six weeks, the very short six weeks I had, it wasn't possible to find, find cases. So that's the plan. Yes. Uh, I want to point out that um, besides witch hunting being targeted, you know, towards women, which is obviously very gendered, isn't it also something to do with uh, the scheduled uh, attack on scheduled castes and scheduled tribes? Because under the uh, you know scheduled castes and scheduled tribes prevention of atrocities act, it clearly mentions there regarding witch hunting. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's mentioned there. Okay. So basically, uh, what I know from my knowledge, and I've seen friends who work in uh, Orissa, it's generally targeted to, it's more of a caste issue, you know? And definitely, like you said, it's related to property, but more of a caste issue, like witch hunting in most of these states, because it's also practiced in Assam and things like that. Yeah, and, right. you know, they link just like this, where, you know, it's mainly on the scheduled tribes, uh, mainly scheduled caste, scheduled tribes. Okay. Thank you. I didn't know it was mentioned in the Prevention of Atrocity Act. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, something I should know. What they so um, as I said earlier to Peter, like I'm not again. I'm not sure which uh, if I had to name the communities, which kind of communities I um, practiced witchcraft. I know they were, I was told tribal communities, the whole community. Um, certain SCST communities also practice witchcraft. Uh, which which witchcraft allegations are prevalent to use kind of lingo in those communities. Um, one of the interesting conceptualizations that I thought so the the in the in this village in uh, called Chaibasa, sorry Chakradarpur, um, the the kind of social health uh, uh, or pub, the community health organization basically the kind of survey of um, violence related um, violence related issues that come up regularly am amongst the amongst the community and the first was domestic violence the second was um, 
uh, witch hunting allegations, right? So those are the types of violence that are prevalent in the com in the in the uh, in the community, and they conceptualized it as a form of domestic violence. So that was quite interesting, right? So they knew about the Domestic Violence Act, um, and they knew that because it happens within kinship groups, within family groups, within uh, within caste groups, um, amongst relatives. So they you they thought of it as a form of domestic violence rather than um, form of intercaste or caste violence, so to speak. Um, but that might just be uh, in that milieu. Um, I'm not sure how it works outside there. Um, yeah, but thank you for the, the comment on the SES you mentioned, the Trustees Act. I I just assumed at the beginning you were talking only from within tribal communities, but clearly you're talking about mixed. There is a caste dimension that comes. There is a caste dimension. It's so it's not it's not so what so the, is there a religious dimension or not? Inter no, as far as well, uh, I met this one uh, one activist back in the and he was instrumental. Um, he claims and other people have claimed in kind of helping or pursuing um, um, the state of Bihar as then was to implement or enact this law. And um, he has all these articles written, written about him. He was very big in newspapers in 99, 98, um, 97 when finally the, kind of the draft came out. Um, his argument was it's uh, that it's, to put it bluntly, is because of the, the Christians and Muslims. Um, and, but amongst the community themselves, that was never the case. Right? They never said that. He was the only person who said it. I put, put that comment aside as a slightly weird comment to make. Um, but um, the, it's, so it's usually not between castes or between tribals, within tribal communities and within caste groups. So um, one of the community health workers um, who just described herself as OBC basically said that there's an OBC Ojha like in their village. Um, so, so it's usually not between caste groups. It's usually not the case that the Ojha is some other community, um, as far as I know, but usually it's within the tribal community or the caste group. So it's not inter-caste or inter-tribal, or between tribe and caste. There's another common question there. Okay, this is the last question. Um, so I'm interested in the context of this conversation, right? Because you said that you're not going into the argument whether witchcraft exists or there is a way to prevent it or pre prevent any or discourage um, any attempt within those practices. They, it's, 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 the title almost comes from a, a point of view that probably it exists or maybe doesn't, but we're just preventing um, these particular people participating in this craft from identifying um, people who they believe to be witches. Would it have made a difference if maybe there was a prevention of witchcraft act in addition to the prevention of identification um, of people who essentially participate in witchcraft acts? Um, would it make a difference? I mean, you the know, prevention of identification is one thing, but that means the practice essentially is ongoing, or there are people who believe yeah. in the practice. So there. Are, so when I asked, the question I asked was, was are there people who self-identify as witches, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the, the resounding answer amongst the community groups of the, the kind of the um, uh, community worker health groups and was a resounding no, right? It wasn't as if people said that they themselves were witches and then we did witchcraft. Um, so that was some, that was an external naming of that person as a witch. Um, uh, who did do which which practices which practices was the Ocha, right? So the Ocha did kind of which doctoring practices, um, uh, where this person did rituals, cure illnesses, whatever through various rituals. Um, um, yeah. So would it make a difference of which I my instinctive answer is to say no, because then what would happen is that the they the victims of the witchcraft who just filed cases against the purported witches. Um, yeah, um, and not, it wouldn't help with anything else. I mean, the act is also kind of, it, so if you kind of um, know Indian um, law on, um, especially inter-caste violence, right? It's the, it's the naming of someone as a caste, identification of someone as caste that is seen as the originator of violence, 
right? Um, so the naming of a chamar, naming of a person as a certain type of caste, is where the violence is seen to stem from. This it's um, so, and the distinction made, and so this the act kind of follows that same logic. That if you, the moment you kind of uh, identify someone as a certain thing, then certain violent consequences will follow, and you need to step start at that point of time of identification. Um, and that's kind of the logic of it. Um, in terms of preventing more, which fact that I mean, I asked the lawyers obviously said increase the punishment um, because that's what lawyers tend to do. Um, but. Uh, um, so the lawyers, yeah, so because the punishment, if I, off the top of my head, if I remember correctly, is not very high. It's like some hundreds of rupees fine, um, a couple, I think maximum two years or three years imprisonment. Um, but the, so the lawyers will say, you know, increase it to like life or you know, whatever. But um, it's uh, the, um, the community activists actually, the same, the same village in, in the spoke of Chaibasa. They were basically saying treat it as a form of domestic violence. So the Domestic Violence Act gives um, the person the right to go to court to, it's not, it's not a criminal offense, it's more of a criminal process where you get protection orders, you can get the courts to order um, the cops to do certain things or not to do certain things. Um, it was interesting from another point as well, is a sense of like a legal consciousness point of view. So the um, the idea was that um, it was almost as if, so in this as a kind of observational point, it was almost as if uh, as we, when you asked about how witchcraft practices happen and the role of the Ocha, people were very animated by it, right? It was this idea that we, and it, it was obviously something that was very familiar and very everyday, but when you ask about the cops and the, the police and the courts, it was almost like a distant, like this magical thing that happened somewhere else. So was, from a legal conscious point of view, it was kind of, uh, kind of a flip of what one might imagine the one shouldn't of how kind of kind of different knowledge systems operate. That one that the law is seen as distant and weird and magical and incomprehensible, whereas witchcraft factors are seen as, as something that's relatable, um, eminently everyday, um, something that's totally understandable in the milieu. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. How uh, so? Have there been any NGOs that have been particularly successful, or community organisations in sort of addressing that imbalance? Also more generally addressing which So the, um, the same in Chaibasa, it's, it's an organization called Ekjut, um, which means together. Um, they do something called a peer learning, um, peer learning activity. So they, their aim is not to um, pedagogy from above. That's the, not their aim. Their aim is to kind of see what the problems are, which is why they ask the community what they think the other main problems are. And they kind of kind of um, engender solutions from within uh, the community, um, and they've taken that approach to maternal health. Um, to uh, um, they had one project on maternal health. They had one project on well, uh, postnatal care, um, and they, I think they're branching into um, branching into bad world. We're kind of getting because of just necessity, getting into issues of domestic violence and violence really drawing from witchcraft allegations. Mm -hmm. um, and they have an article in the Lancet which talks about the um, the work on maternal health um, and that approach, the peer learning um, activities and approach to um, dealing with maternal, maternal health issues. Um, I guess they're trying it out with witch hunting allegations as well to see what kind of things are going on. Um, but everyone was like, you know, what's the point? One of them said, what's the point of going to the cops? What's the point of going to the courts? Um, so I, also because, because these states are quite remote, they're quite distant, it's difficult to get to um, uh, public transport between the village and um, there's no police station in every village. You have to go to the block headquarters or to the district headquarters um, to get to make a police complaint or file a case. So um, yeah, the, those are kind of the structural issues at play. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I walked in a little late, so I don't know if you dealt with it, and I'm not sure how tangential this is. But with regards to like, what do you find out about sexual violence? And because I come from India, so the idea of witches is, is somewhat portrayed as a promiscuous woman, you know? So like, how is like, how are they targeted with regards to sexual violence? What is their status after they go to the police? Or you know, they, they seek uh, help? Like, do they become outcasts? 
Are they accepted back into society? Um, That's two different questions. So, in terms of uh, as far as I know, there was no sexual violence that committed against a person accused of being a witch. Right? There was forms of uh, sexual violence that's formed of sexual assault. There were forms of sexualized violence in the sense that they were forced um, to go naked, um, their faces were blackened. Um, uh, one of the interesting logics I heard behind it was that the moment, because the essence of a witch lies inside the person, and that, that essence of the witch also has um, a form of shame. Right? So if the person is walking naked, the essence of the witch gets shamed and leaves the person's body. Um, there's another logic and um, one, I was told of one narrative where the, um, the woman was cut and her blood fell on the ground and then the violence stopped apparently, this is what I was told. And the logic is that the essence of the witch came out with the blood and once the moment the blood falls on the ground, it's, um, it's a, the, the, for lack of a better term, the witchness goes out. Um, so, but that's forms of violence again that, that are kind of inbuilt into the logic of, of the witchcraft belief. Um, the, in turn, what was the other question, sorry? Like, their status after they seek and outcasts so, from the community. Um, again, um, the two instances I can point to, one is the case of Jagat Munda, the person I spoke about, he's back in his village, um, uh, apparently, I, I never met him, so I don't know, but I was told by the lawyer, he's back in the village. Um, in terms of, um, so one of the big um, kind of social health, uh, or public health organizations, uh, public education organizations, um, that deals with issues of witchcraft and are founded by a former person who was accused of being witchcraft. Um, and she spoke actually quite moving about how she was forced out of the thing, but she's back in the village doing public health, uh, public education initiatives. Um, statistically, again, I think people come back to the village um, if they aren't, you know, if they're not killed or be badly assaulted. But I think of the um, of the 88 cases that the, the PLD report talks about, most of the people are back in the same village um, after a period of leaving. But again, this is a limited statistics, limited sample, just based on police complaints. So, I do have the impression that these are traditional practices which uh, the media, the legal system, have just focused on recently, or is this a, a new phenomenon? So, I mean, I asked the question. Um, I, I, I mean, I hesitate to use tradition. It's also the baggage along with it. Um, it's evident that it's been, I think it's going um, a long, going on for a long time. Um, I asked when did it start. Um, most of the tribal community interestingly said it's always been with us. Um, all the people I spoke to from the tribal community have always been with us. Um, it seemed to have moved more recently. Uh, again, there's no date on it, but I think just a conception that it had moved more recently um, into the SC and OBC communities. Um, uh, and why are the media picking it up right now? I'm not sure. Um, it's it's been in well, I mean it's been in the Hindi news for a while. So like if you um, set up a Google alert and, and every day they take something on the Hindi news, um, something comes through on uh, on which which or something. Um, and it's evidently been a problem. Um, so the person who I spoke to, Jan Chetpur, the person who's who claims to be instrumental in passing the law um, ha has paper cuttings going back to the 70s and 80s. Um, I mean, it's an anthropological joke, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Witchcraft and, yeah, yeah. and so on. Witchcraft and magic. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, I was intrigued. We didn't talk about uh, the fertility argument which yeah. you made, uh, at all. I know. And, uh, since this is also about the environment and so on, I wonder whether you. You, you're trying to make a link somehow. I, I just assume, you know, if the land, you know, with mm. global warming and so on, dries up, etc., do you assume, according to your theorizing, that the witchcraft accusations will uh, rise? I mean, reading the land, I find this fascinating. Uh, and uh, 
have you studied uh, how a person reads the land? No, because I didn't, I didn't meet it. Well, I, I saw it, which are, because one of the first person told me that person in Ocha, but I, mm -hmm. all the napkins of what the Ocha does are second hand mm -hmm. from people who have either visited the Ocha or um, have seen what the Ocha does. So the, the narrative of the marriage was by the person who was married. Um, the person who was ill because of the thief was because they went to the Ocha. The so I never actually saw what the Ocha does. Um, that's one of the aims when we go back to the field is hopefully just kind of concentrate mm -hmm. more over there. Um, whether it increases, that's a good question actually. Um, and which is why I don't think, I think the argument of fertility, uh, I stretched a bit in the, in the abstract. It's not, I don't think I can sustain it. The idea was that if the land itself um, kind of fails, is there, a, is there an argument that to be made around uh, witchcraft? Is there some link to witch, witchcraft? Um, most of the allegations of witchcraft came up because of illness or an accident. Um, what we would call an accident, right? So falling off a tree, there was another instance where, and this kind of shows the randomness of, of the argument of witchcraft, is that this guy was, was an alcoholic, so said that he was of that, in that person, was kind of like every day drunk on his bike. He would fall, fall over, obviously, since he was drunk. He had several accidents. After a period of time, it was it was less that you know you fall once because you're drunk, that's fine. But if you fall multiple times, it must because it must be because of witchcraft. Um, so it's a link to the idea of health. So maybe there's an angle over there in terms of health, and just not fertility of the land, but fertility of the productivity of of the person. Um, fertility broadly conceived, rather than productivity of the land. Um, many of the cases weren't about fertility of the land itself. Well, none of the cases actually. None of the narratives that came across were about fertility, fertility of land. They were about looking at certain signs of the land for an illness, or can tell us why the illness took place. Um, but that's an interesting argument to make. There's an argument made by, um, I can't remember, the Federica Fellini, I think is her name, which talks about kind of witchcraft arising because of um, the enclosure movement, this is in Europe obviously, enclosures, uh, link, drawing the link between enclosures, capitalism, and um, increased witchcraft al allegations. Um, it's not something I feel like the material lends itself to at the moment, but it's something that I'll definitely like to explore in the future. So, when you say Ocha, do you think it really the people believe that the Oja has a speech of power. Yeah, so basically that's what they believe, that they, um, the Oja has access to knowledge mm -hmm. um, and can, I don't know about spiritual, right, but has access to knowledge and way to deal with spirits, or deal with, um, mm -hmm. deal with kind of these quote unquote supernatural threats. Right, um, and I think that's what the belief system is: is that the Oja can tell you whether it's a fruit or a fruit that's infected you, or it can tell you who, why your grain is suddenly going away, or whether it's a witch who's um, done something to you. So people, when they ill or some bad person, they go to Oja to get some advice. Yeah, they go to the Oja to get advice um, on on why they're ill, um, what they can do to to mm -hmm. ameliorate that illness. Um, and it depends on the nature of what, what, what causes the illness. Um. So are there cases, I mean, of people who already know that who the witch is before going to the Oja? Yeah, so like I said in the kind of first slide, it's tucked away on the top, was that there are cases where there's, some, there's no witch involved, right? That it is just generally known in the village that a person is a witch. Um, again, I have spent enough time, so I don't know how that knowledge has come about um, or why a certain person gets called a witch. Um, so on that kind of aspect, I, I don't know, um, is my answer. Um, but a lot of the narratives involve the figure of the Ocha. So, um, that's a good question because uh, what kind of the law doesn't take into account is kind of the 
badly played, the collateral damage of the Wikrata allegation, like what happens after, or what happens to the surrounding people, what happens to the children. Um, so usually the, the husband is only beaten up as um, on the way, right? Um, not in the sense, sorry, it's a bad phrase. But usually it's, it's um, not, not, not the sole target of the thing. Um, so the, in one, one of the narratives that I heard was that, um, so basically this woman is being, uh, uh, was accused of being a witch. Um, they, what they first did was, is they, in order to get to the woman, they, they had to kill the man. They tried to go in once, the man beat them away. I'm not sure how, but he beat them away, they, they went away. Then what they did, or what I was told they did, was that they pretended to be friends with him, um, got him drunk, put some medicines in him, took him to the river close by, drowned him over there, and then took the wife and drowned her, killed her, and then put her body in the, in the water. Um, so there are kind of knock-on effects, or it's again a bad thing, but I don't think the, the men are usually not the prime target. Um, they are just targets when, or the husbands are usually just targets, unless the, they themselves are accused of being a witch, in which case it's a different thing. But where, where the wives are accused of being a witch, then it's, um, they're not a prime target. And even in the case which I mentioned earlier about this person who get, who's get, whose wife gets shot, in the narrative that the, that the report builds up at least, he had gone off, they had timed it in such a way that he had gone off to the field and she was home alone. Um, so, but they, again, they themselves are all these back in the village. Right, it seems we have run out of steam. Thank you very much indeed for this interesting talk and discussion. Thank you.